Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And unfortunately, today we have what I would describe as a politics adjacent episode for you. As you can see on your screen, I've pulled up the image of what people on Twitter were seeing yesterday as they tried to retweet or forward or comment on or just link the New York Post article that you can also see as part of this thumbnail. Now, before we get started, for those of you that are new to virtual legality, this is not a politics series. This is not a politics channel. What we are going to talk about is my opinion, my issues with how Twitter and Facebook are dealing with this particular concept, the who watches the watchers or who censors the censors kind of question. But it is not advocating for Republicans. It's not advocating for Democrats. If you love Joe Biden and you're going to vote for him, great. If you don't like Joe Biden and you're going to vote against him, also fine. Same for Trump. Same for Joe Jorgensen. Whoever it is that you're going to vote for, this series and this episode of Virtual Legality doesn't care. What we do care about is the dissemination of information, the battle of ideas you might have heard me refer to it to in prior episodes of this series, and what Twitter and Facebook and probably the rest of the big tech giants are doing to really squash that battle of ideas, to come in and insert their own opinion as to what you or I should even have available to us to see so that we can make our own conclusions And I've got an issue with that. I know a lot of you have watched this series know that I have certain issues with various of the big tech giants and certain issues with some of the companies that are bringing their claims against them and the Judiciary Committee and all these various things. But at the end of the day, what I'm in favor of is freedom of speech, the freedom of communication, the free exchange of ideas, and to have misinformation crushed by good information, by good ideas, by better ideas. And unfortunately, Twitter and Facebook are not allowing that to happen as it stands today. So without further ado, let's take a look at this New York Post article. Now, we aren't going to go over the substance of this article. That's politics. It'll be linked in this description. Hopefully, YouTube won't just kill the video. Who knows? But we will link it in the description. You can check it out for yourself. What we are going to talk about is what the New York Post said was essentially the origin of the information contained in this article, because that's what's important for the discussion we're going to have today. So they say the blockbuster correspondence, this is emails that they are claiming that they have found, is contained in a massive trove of data recovered from a laptop computer. The computer was dropped off at a repair shop in Biden's home state of Delaware in April 2019. The customer who brought in the water-damaged MacBook Pro for repair never paid for the service or retrieved it or a hard drive on which its contents were stored, according to the shop owner, who said he tried repeatedly to contact the client. The shop owner couldn't positively identify the customer as Hunter Biden, but said the laptop bore a sticker from the Bo Biden Foundation, named after Hunter's late brother and former Delaware Attorney General. Photos of a Delaware federal subpoena given to the Post show that both the computer and hard drive were seized by the FBI in December after the shop's owner says he alerted the feds to their existence. But but before turning over the gear, the shop owner says he made a copy of the hard drive and later gave it to former Mayor Rudy Giuliani's lawyer, Robert Costello. Steve Bannon, former advisor to President Trump, told the Post about the existence of the hard drive in late September and Giuliani provided the Post with a copy of it on Sunday. Now, you don't have to have watched every episode of Virtual Legality to know that that series of paragraphs describing where this information came from is something that I would put three red flags on and two sirens and tell you, hey, we don't only have to take this with a grain of salt, we have to take this with an entire salt mine, throw it over our shoulder and spin around three times just to make sure that anything in this article is valid, truthful, or otherwise that we should be paying attention to. But... We, as adults or other interested members of the United States or around the world, would be making that determination for ourselves, saying, hey, okay, so that origination set of paragraphs makes me look at that and say, well, that doesn't sound like what would likely happen in these kinds of scenarios, but Facebook and Twitter wanted to do it for us. So we've got Andy Stone here tweeting out that while I will intentionally not link to the New York Post, I want to be clear that this story is eligible to be fact-checked by Facebook's third-party fact-checking partners. In the meantime, we are reducing its distribution on our platform. 
So understand Facebook's stance on an article like this. We don't know. We're going to submit it to a third party fact checking partner, which in and of itself is its own conversation. And before we know whether or not there is an issue, we are going to reduce distribution in the first instance that their technological platform, before they know whether or not anything is truthful or false, regardless of what their third party partners might say, is going to reduce distribution until they know for sure. The New York Post would later come on and editorialize about Facebook here and say that they were censoring it before they even knew whether or not it was true or false. He doubles down and says, this is part of our standard process to reduce the spread of misinformation. We temporarily reduce distribution pending fact check or review. But if we go and we look at the actual article that he is referencing, that he linked to in that tweet, we know that that isn't actually what happens with every article, which you probably already know if you use Facebook to any extent. They don't just kill distribution of all articles at moment one until a fact checker can determine whether they are truthful. They mostly let articles go through, and if there's a fact-checking issue, then they check it. So we've got up this link helping to protect the 2020 U.S. elections by, among others, Guy Rosen as the vice president of integrity. I I love Silicon Valley companies. I love social media and big tech giants because you get things like the vice president of integrity. If I was working at one of these, I think I would have gone for the vice president of courage or bravery. Uh, But either way, Guy Rosen, vice president of integrity, and a bunch of other people, their public policy director, their head of cybersecurity policy, they go forth with this article late last year that says one of the things we want to do at Facebook is prevent the spread of misinformation including clearer fact-checking labels. Now, if you've been on Facebook, you know it's an apocalyptic hellscape of misinformation and random tweets and posts from your uncles and aunts and family members and other folks that you know that may or may not be true. And if you're operating in that environment, you know to use a critical eye to evaluate these things. But Facebook itself wants to step in, and not just Facebook. There's people all over the place in legacy media, around the dinner table, all across the United States, and I would guess across the world, that say Facebook and Twitter and Google and YouTube should be engaged in this, should be stopping the spread of misinformation. The problem is that at every level, in order to determine what is information versus what is misinformation, somebody somewhere needs to make that determination. And Facebook wants to do it for you, and so does Twitter and all these various things. And that presents the problem of who watches the watchers, who is actually deciding these things. Because when Facebook makes these determinations, it means that you don't get to make the determination for yourself. They come in before you would otherwise look at these articles. On Facebook and Instagram, we work to keep confirmed misinformation from spreading, right? Remember, the tweets from Andy Stone here say, this is just what we do. This is part of our standard process. We temporarily reduce distribution pending fact check or review. But all they say in this section is that when we have confirmed misinformation, we prevent it from spreading. If we go a little bit lower in the section, they say, in the U.S., if we have signals that a piece of content is false, we temporarily reduce its distribution pending review by a third-party fact checker. So he doesn't actually reference the fact that Facebook is already making a determination before anybody else has looked at this article that it has perceived signals that the article is false. Now, That's fine. As we talked about when we looked at the article ourselves, I think a lot of those paragraphs you say, hmm, I don't know. Some of that story doesn't seem very likely, especially the folks whose hands the laptop and hard drive apparently got into at the end of that story. So is that a signal of falsity? I don't know. If you go on Twitter, you'll find a lot of people very adamant that that article is either very true or very much a Russian disinformation campaign. But one of the things we don't know is who's right on that particular argument. And we can't know it if all of the big tech giants like Facebook and Twitter and everyone else were to just suppress it from being distributed entirely, which is why I was led to look at this story in the first place, right? There was a tweet shortly after Facebook acted from a person named Alex Thompson that said, wow, Twitter going even further than Facebook and is no longer letting people tweet the New York Post story. This is what pops up if you try. And you see a similar version of what I showed at the top of this video, tweet not sent. Your tweet couldn't be sent because this link has been identified by Twitter or our partners as being potentially harmful. Now, one of the interesting things about that note in and of itself is it tends to read as something like a Windows security warning or an Android security warning, right? That there are malicious links in there, that they can take your financial information. And indeed, if you click through these things and you go to the help center, you actually see that Twitter combines this warning that is actually not about 
anything malicious or Trojan horses or anything like that with what are just violations of their policies as determined by Twitter. So if you go and you click through a couple of these windows, you will see, oh, we've identified that this might have malicious code, might steal your stuff, or is otherwise in breach of one of our policies. And I want to give the hat tip now to Joseph LaRussa, at Joseph LaRussa, who actually pointed me to this story, which I wound up following for the bulk of yesterday. He says, I'm not entirely sure why I'm tagging you in this. Just feels like something you should see and or may be interested in. And I thank him for that. I wound up saying what you will hear if you're in a too long, didn't watch kind of mood, although you've already made it 10 minutes or more with me right now, that this was honestly unbelievable. And that I don't care which side of the political spectrum you are on you should be very concerned about some company across the country deciding what is and is not acceptable for you to see. Now, if you're interested in a number of people on Twitter calling me names and otherwise calling into question my judgment and good faith, please feel free to click on that tweet and go and look at the comments that I received to it. It was called a whole number of things that I hadn't actually heard before, so check that out if you're interested. But ultimately, I really don't care whether you're Republican or Democrat or Libertarian or Green Party or whatever. What I care about is these communications-based companies deciding that you don't get to see that article anymore because we've decided on high that it's misinformation, right? And they would actually continue with this. I would wind up saying, hey, if Facebook and Twitter are acting in this way in concert, really almost immediately, identically at the same time, that I'm beginning to think these big tech companies are run by the dumbest CEOs on the planet, or if I'm being a little bit more cynical and I put my lawyer and economist hat on, are actively engaged in a campaign to force regulation as a means of locking in their market share and increasing barriers to entry for nascent competitors, right? We've talked about that in this space, regulatory capture. That if you're a giant company like Twitter or Facebook or Google or anybody else, and you can go and you can get Congress to enforce these regulations and you already exist and have this big market share, then that's going to make the barriers to entry that much larger for whoever might come in to try to swoop up that market share. Right now, it's hard to look at these actions when these companies are already under investigation by various aspects of the United States government, the European Union government, all various places around the world, and say, you aren't trying to deliberately start this fight, right? When you take an action that is that broad and that just out there publicly, where you have people trying to retweet a story and just get blocked and don't tell them anything, I have to think you are trying to cause this fight with the U.S. government, if not more governments, and I don't know why, except if you're trying to regulatorily capture your market share and get involved in the actual writing of the rules that are going to prescribe your industry space. Now, Jack, the CEO of Twitter, would come on and say the following about all this. He would say, our communication around our actions on the New York Post article, not great. And blocking URL sharing via tweet or direct message with zero context, now, blocking it via direct message is interesting in and of itself, as to why we're blocking unacceptable. It's totally okay that we did this, but we have to explain it better. And we're going to go through that explanation in just a second. I want to back up a step because a lot of people will come in here and they've came into my comments. They've otherwise talked to me about these kinds of things and said, well, Twitter is totally allowed to do that. They're a private company. And in fact, we'll get to a tweet that I made yesterday to that effect. Twitter is absolutely allowed to do this. Twitter is absolutely allowed to take whatever actions that they want to take. And everyone else is allowed to criticize them for it. Twitter has made its hay, like a lot of the big tech Silicon Valley giants, in ascribing to themselves values that generally Americans like. The values of the freedom of speech, the freedom of association, the free expression of ideas, that battle of ideas concept that we don't judge the context. We don't judge the content. We are just here as a communications platform. That's where our value lives. And if we're going to act in local parentis, if we're going to step in and say, well, this story is OK and not this one, then at bare minimum, not even getting into liabilities or legalities, which we will talk about as part of this video, then people should trust them less. People should be less inclined to believe that they are true communications platforms because you're not getting that neutral square approach. And Twitter doesn't have to deliver it, but it means that the value that they are delivering to their customers isn't as valuable as they thought it was as of two days ago, right? So Jack goes out there with this. I think he's absolutely lowering the value of his platform, but that's only really the beginning of what they try to achieve here. So Facebook, you saw, said basically, we think that there are signals that this is untrue because we think there are those signals. We are going to 
kill distribution of the article until we have a third party fact checker look at it for us. And it's unclear exactly what role that third party fact checker could have if the New York Post is keeping all the information to itself and is going to deliver them in these stories that come out yesterday and today and presumably for the next two weeks as they kind of drip feed these various emails and things that they claim to have. But Facebook was at least honest about it, right? Facebook went out there and said, we don't think it's true. And whether or not you think that that is because they really don't think it's true or because they are uh, run by Democratic operatives and they just don't want to share the, the information, that's fine too. If you go and you look at Andy Stone's description here, you'll see that he's an alumni of Senator Boxer's campaign, uh, the Democratic Congressional Committee, all these various things. He, he was a Democratic operative. Doesn't mean he's not doing his job now right, uh, very well, but it does mean that you can call those things into question just like we can call into question the veracity of the New York Post article itself. Twitter went in a different direction, a a direction that we just said was backed up by Jack. They said that we want to provide much needed clarity around the actions we've taken with respect to two New York Post articles that were first tweeted this morning. Now, reasonable minds can differ, as we say in this space. I don't think much clarity is actually provided, and, and we're going to talk about why. The first tweet that they give is about the privacy policy. The images contained in the articles include personal and private information like email addresses and phone numbers, which violate our rules. Now, the New York Post does include, as a backstop for their reporting, images and scribbed files and things like that that relate to the emails that they are reporting on and the photos that they are reporting on. And there are some email addresses in there that are not redacted. There's other information that is redacted. One of the things that Twitter is saying here is that because they included the source material that they are reporting on ostensibly, that that gets them into more trouble than if they had not. However, if we go and we actually look through their privacy policy, we can see one of the things that is not a violation is sharing information that is publicly available elsewhere in a non-abusive manner. And Twitter was just killing a direct link to the article. It couldn't be abusive because you were just linking the article in and of itself. There's no question that once it's published in the New York Post, these kinds of things are publicly available. We aren't talking about Twitter users or, or tweets that are deliberately hacking into things and getting private information or otherwise doxing people. We're talking about somebody linking a article from a major national publication, which no, you don't have to believe, but you also don't have to believe that it's a violation of this policy. And I don't really even think that Twitter necessarily thinks this is their best argument because indeed what they wind up doing is bringing in a different argument. As noted this morning, we also currently view materials included in the articles as violations of our hacked materials policy. Now, when we go and we look at the distribution of hacked materials policy, we see it was updated in March of 2019, but we also see that it doesn't have definitions, right? And we've talked about this in virtual legality in the past. One of the problems with the very friendly terms of service, the ones that are designed to be plain English and easily read, is that you don't actually get the contours for what is prohibited or what is allowed in the same way that you do with some legalese. You don't get defined terms. So what we get is we don't like hacked materials, and we really only have a couple references to what Twitter means by that where they say we don't condone attempts to compromise or infiltrate computer systems for malicious purposes. Okay, compromise or infiltrate for malicious purposes. You haven't defined it in a way that I wasn't expecting, so I wind up thinking about actual hacks, things that compromise computer systems, breaking into passwords, breaking into networks. And so if that isn't the case here, and certainly the New York Post reported on something that it's difficult to claim directly is a hack, that somebody in the Biden family apparently left a computer at a computer repair store, never collected it, the FBI subpoenaed it. The only thing that's really close to potentially being a hack right there is the copying of the hard drive and then the distribution to Rudy Giuliani's lawyer. And again, that's the paragraphs that really raised the red flags for me, whereas uh, this doesn't make a lot of sense here towards the end of this origination story. But it isn't how we would traditionally think of hacking. Now, some people came onto social media and said, hey, it was abandoned property. It's not hacking at all. It was just the computer store owners. And I think you have a problem with that story too, although it again presents these questions where reasonable minds can differ and that the adults in the room should probably be allowed to determine for themselves without Jack saying, no, you're not allowed to see this thing. If we go and we look at the Delaware mortgages and other liens chapter, we see the definition that they give to abandoned personal property, which is tangible personal property. That's going to be a personal computer. It's tangible. You can hold it, which the rightful owner has left in the care or custody of another, which is the claim in the New York Post. 
and which that person that gave it to them has failed to maintain, pay for the storage of, exercise control over, and has otherwise failed to assert or declare ownership rights for a period of one year, right? If you remember that New York Post article, that's one of the things that is going to be a problem here for just claiming it's abandoned personal property. It was delivered to the store in April, subpoenaed by the FBI in December, copied before it was given to the FBI, and then transferred to Rudy Giuliani's lawyer. That's actually not abandoned personal property in Delaware. That's actually doubled down on if you look at these other statutes where you say you only actually take title, you take control of this property upon order of the court, right? Upon order of the court, any person who holds property abandoned by the owner shall be vested with complete and absolute title to said abandoned personal property. If it's just abandoned and you don't go get a court order in Delaware, by the looks of things, not a Delaware attorney, but I can read statutes, you probably don't have specific title to that. And you probably could get in trouble for treating the property as potentially stolen or converted because you don't have that year-long period which the Congress in Delaware has determined to be a satisfactory period to establish that that person is not coming back for the property. April to December, Delaware doesn't think is enough as written in the statute. April to April, and then it's enough and you can go petition the court and say, hey, I want this laptop to be mine. That never happened because apparently the FBI intervened and this gentleman maybe converted it, maybe stole it, maybe hacked it. Don't know. Don't know because we don't have enough of the facts for ourselves, but neither does Facebook or Twitter, which leaves us in the same position as we were at the start of this video, right? Is this hacked material? I don't know. And neither does Twitter, but they are going to accuse it of being hacked material even without knowing at the outset. Now, they also point out that commentary on or discussion about hacked materials, such as articles that cover them but do not include or link to the materials themselves, aren't a violation of this policy. Our policy only covers links to or images of hacked material themselves. Said another way, they are arguing that if the New York Post had just included its text and not included the pictures, not included the source material to the emails, not allowed its readership to evaluate these things for themselves, they wouldn't have gotten into trouble with Twitter, which if you are anything like me, sounds exactly backwards to what we would want as critical thinkers in the room. We want to be able to see that email. We want to be able to read the dossier that BuzzFeed actually put up in its entirety because we want to be able to evaluate the veracity of those documents ourselves. And I think there's ample reason to believe that the New York Post article is not completely truthful, does not contain accurate facts on one or a number of aspects. But not including the source material doesn't make, doesn't make it more likely for me to be able to ascertain it. It makes it me not be able to ascertain it, right? If you don't have access to that source material, it makes it more difficult. But they need to make this kind of distinction because otherwise you have what people have presented on social media, a problem, right? In one of the real big articles in this election season, the New York Times posted a lot of details about President Trump's taxes. Now, there's no way the New York Times can get that information unless somebody in the chain of custody acted illegally, converted it, stole it, leaked it somehow to the New York Times. So these materials, which absolutely contain personal information about President Trump and his finances, have been leaked to the New York Times. The New York Times has them illegally. The press doesn't have it illegally, but somebody acted illegally in the chain of custody and Twitter doesn't want to block those kinds of articles. And with good reason, this is important information for the body politic to have, but they try to slice this onion pretty thinly because they want that article to survive in the wild while this article doesn't. When, if you are of a political stripe, it certainly looks for all the world like you're killing an anti-Biden article and allowing an anti-Trump article and that's going to raise some issues for a lot of folks. They continue by saying the policy was actually established in 2018, and it prohibits the use of our service to distribute content obtained without authorization. Now, it actually only does that with respect to hacking. I looked at that website. It's the same as the policy that we just looked at. This is a poor tweet because people can use it, and it suggests that they mean that anything that is distributing content obtained without authorization is a problem when they are really trying to aim it at malicious computer usage which unfortunately isn't much of a limit because almost all the information that we're going to have today or elsewhere is going to be held on computers. It wouldn't surprise me if the New York Times got that tax information somewhere along the lines from something leaked out of a computer or a computer network somewhere. But Twitter wants to say, hey, we just don't allow these kinds of things. And, you know, they can make that claim, but it does strain credibility just a bit. 
Twitter Safety finally says, we know we have more work to do to provide clarity in our product when we enforce our rules in this manner. We should provide additional clarity and context when preventing the tweeting or DMing of URLs that violate our policies. We recognize that Twitter is just one of many places where people can find information online, and the Twitter rules are intended to protect the conversation on our service and to add context to people's experience where we can. That's a wild final tweet of this particular thread, right? What has happened here is that Twitter is killing the distribution of an article on its service. And they have framed that killing of distribution as adding context to people's experience. I don't see how that works. I don't think that you are likely to see how that works, but reasonable minds can and always will differ. Now, Twitter actually went further and they apparently have gone further today. I think they're killing the current New York Post article from this morning. They wound up hitting things like the press secretary's personal Twitter account for what? Not violations of privacy. They realize, I think, that that's probably a loser because these things are in a major periodical that is being distributed to millions of people, that they are violating our rules against the distribution of hacked material. It's unclear if there was a hack there. It's unclear if there was an abandoned property concept. It's unclear on all these kinds of things, but Twitter is restricting this distribution nonetheless and is in fact locking accounts and not just locking accounts of the press secretary, locking accounts of the GOP judiciary right? The Judiciary Committee of the House, the GOP portion wound up doing a tweet that copied the article from the New York Post, that actually put the New York Post article in their own press release. And what the Twitter folks wound up doing was actually prohibiting distribution of the Judiciary Committee's tweets. Now, they wound up actually putting it in another person's uh, tweets, I believe. They sent it to the senior ranking member, and they continue to try to publicize this on Twitter, but it's really becoming a a big deal as we look at how Twitter and Facebook are acting on these things as these government Twitter sources now are being banned and blocked and other folks are being banned and blocked at the same time. The other problem that Twitter has in this entire story is that it doesn't appear to be as truthful as Facebook. You can hate Facebook, you can hate Twitter, but at least Facebook says, hey, we don't think it's truthful. Maybe we think we just are in favor of a Biden presidency and that's how this platform is going to operate. Now, you can have your own issues with that. We're going to talk about Josh Hawley in just a second, but they are being more truthful than Twitter in this whole hacked materials kind of concept. In fact, Twitter wound up going out with spokesperson talk to places like CNBC, which is on your screen right now, saying it was decided to limit the spread of the article due to the lack of authoritative reporting around the origins of the information in it, which sounds an awful lot like you don't agree with the truthfulness of the article, slash, we can assume that anything that is leaked is hacked unless you prove otherwise, which is, of course, a very difficult burden to reach. And you could argue that the New York Times of the world fail to reach it as well, which winds up with how you get to me saying Twitter and Facebook are acting dumb because there are plenty of grandstanding senators and folks in the government that are fully ready and willing to jump on this kind of thing. And of course, when I talk about grandstanding, I'm always talking about Senator Josh Hawley, who tweeted out shortly after all this was going down, I am asking the Federal Election Commission whether this coordinated intervention by Facebook and Twitter for the Biden campaign constitutes a violation of campaign finance or other election laws. He wound up even putting together a formal letter to that effect, saying that this conduct does not merely censor the core political speech of ordinary Americans, though it certainly does that. Twitter's and Facebook's conduct also appears to constitute a clear violation of federal campaign finance law. Federal law prohibits any corporation from making a contribution to a federal candidate for office. Indeed, it does. Twitter and Facebook are both corporations. A contribution includes anything of value for the purpose of influencing any election for federal office. Twitter's and Facebook's active suppression of public speech about the New York Post article appears to constitute contributions under federal law. There can be no serious doubt that the Biden campaign derives extraordinary value from from depriving voters access to information that, if true, would link the former vice president to corrupt Ukrainian oligarchs. And this censorship manifestly will influence the presidential election, which might be accurate. But of course, the federal campaign finance laws are really designed around actual contributions. There are, of course, indirect contribution concepts. But anything that anybody does on any given day in election season could be seen as contributing in one way or the other to either their preferred candidate or the other 
party's preferred candidate. If, for instance, you're acting poorly and that is demonstrated to the world and you are backing one of the candidates, that could be seen as a contribution to the opposite candidate. In general, and I would say this to Republicans and Democrats and anybody else, we should be cautious about using the federal campaign laws to suggest that anything anybody does could be deemed a contribution. And here, Twitter has put forward what might not be a pretextual reason for why they are doing this, and that's hacked materials. You could make a letter like this. You could come back to the Federal Election Commission if Twitter was shown to be acting pretextually later on. For instance, if they don't do a similar restriction for something that was maybe in favor uh, of Biden or maybe against Trump, then you could start to build that case out to say, hey, this was all pretextual and they're only acting on one political side or the other. And maybe You could make the case that that's a campaign contribution. But even in the Mueller report, if you remember, where you had these kinds of interactions between various parties and various officials and various individuals, the Mueller report doesn't come out and say that anybody had a contribution on an election basis. And one of the sections in that report says that's because this is a very, very tenuous area of law. It hasn't been adjudicated to any large extent. And there are very reasonable folks that think that this is probably a constitutional violation to suggest that speech in various manners that you are otherwise allowed to do should suddenly not be allowed under the context of an election suggests problems with the constitutional application of things like the First Amendment and the freedom of speech and the freedom of press. So Senator Hawley does this. He's a blowhard. He's a grandstander. If you've been in virtual legality, you know I don't like the bills that he puts forth. I don't like his thought process on a lot of these things. So this isn't unusual but it should be expected if you're the CEO of Facebook or Twitter and you do something this bald-faced, this broadly, this right out in public with big old lights on it, that two weeks before the election, you're going to restrict access to what appears to be a bombshell, if it were true, in the New York Post. You are going to get letters like this. You're going to get this grandstanding. And at the end of the day, you might well get regulated. Maybe that's what you want, but you will. The other thing that I've seen a lot of is with respect to CDA Section 230, which you've heard me talk about in virtual legality before. This is the two laws that basically say that Twitter isn't going to be deemed the publisher of things that it doesn't specifically say. That if you were linking to the New York Post and Twitter did nothing and the New York Post was otherwise found to be libelous later on because Biden and his family sues them, then it's not Twitter that gets sued. It's not Twitter that has damages. It's the New York Post which of course raises the interesting contrast, right? That the New York Post is publishing this and they are on the line for what they publish. They are actually liable for any lies that they make against Biden and the Biden family in a very real way. Whereas section 230 of the CDA says Twitter isn't. If Twitter didn't do anything about this, they wouldn't be liable. And so they're taking an extra step for no specific reason other than the fact that the company wants to do it. The second part of this law is, of course, what Twitter actually did. And this says that you aren't liable for the moderation decisions that you make. This is one of those areas where President Trump and really candidate Biden agree that this is a problem, uh, at least according to them, that these companies can do these moderative abilities, that they can use them in good faith to restrict access to things that they otherwise find objectionable and you don't have civil liability. Now, that civil liability doesn't really extend to things like federal election laws or state election laws because you do have all these carve outs that none of these safe harbors count for criminal law, intellectual property law, state law, all these various things. So CDA 230 doesn't actually apply that much, which is one of the things I would probably comment on to people that are bringing it up as part of this debate on Twitter or Facebook or YouTube or wherever you're having it. But it is an important kind of countervailing consideration to this conversation because CDA 230 is going to be looked at in the next couple of years. Things like the antitrust reforms that are put forth by the Democratic majority in the antitrust subcommittee of the judiciary are going to be looked at in the next couple of years. These are important conversations to have. And so, yeah, when Twitter and Facebook act like this in concert within hours of each other to restrict access to what is otherwise a widely read periodical, this is the conversation that is going to develop. Now, I will say one of the other things that people say, and I think they're well-meaning people, and I have no problem with somebody believing this. You heard me say it earlier in the video, is that I see this response a lot. I like, I like this from Twitter, that they aren't letting misinformation spread. And we already talked about why that's an issue for me. But generally speaking, the issue is that you have to rely on someone else to determine what is information or misinformation before you. And I think we can, a lot of us agree that Mark Zuckerberg and 
Jack at Twitter and various other big tech magnates are not who we would think of as making the best judgments for our personal lives each and every day and each and every second. And so what I say, and this is from a couple of months ago, is that even with the breadth of political punditry on display in 2020, and I use breadth in quotes because there's some pretty zany theories and craziness out there, I think that wanting to empower or mandate Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg to separate information from misinformation is the height of stupidity. To mandate that this third party go in there and figure out what is true or false and make sure that you don't see things, not that are actually true or false, but that they deem to not be false or deem to be false and not true, that you don't get to see those things at the command of Mark Zuckerberg is not anything that anybody should want. Even if you align yourself with Jack or Mark Zuckerberg as of today. And a lot of people do, and that's fine. But Jack or Mark Zuckerberg could get hit by a bus, could wake up with a different personality tomorrow, and then when they're not on your side, they can still do whatever it is that they want, and you can't evaluate for yourself the truth or falseness of whatever it is that you would otherwise read. No, the right way to handle these kinds of things is how we see it handled in the Daily Beast, right? This is an article from the Daily Beast, came out yesterday in response to this New York Post article, says Trump knew for days that Rudy's hit on Hunter Biden was coming from the top down. And then we go and we read this article, right? And you can look at this for yourself. I'll link this in the description. But we see some of the red flags that I've shown in virtual legality before. This says, ooh, this is according to two sources familiar with the matter. Donald Trump was made aware of this trove of material and was, it was in favor of it. All these various things. You see references to these parties, these anonymous sources close to the president. But you also see some important work. They say, for example, the metadata on the PDF files purporting to show Hunter Biden's emails published by the Post suggest that they were created on a Mac laptop on September 29th and October 10th, 2019. Now, why is that date important, especially to the Daily Beast? The timing of the creation of those PDF files several months after Biden allegedly dropped off his laptop at the PC repair store in April 2019 raises questions. And indeed it does. This is what the battle of ideas looks like, right? And I certainly have my own issues with these anonymous sources about Donald Trump and his thought process here. And I think that you can absolutely take those with a grain of salt, but this is what that looks like. This looks like a New York Post article where you can make reasonable questions about whether or not that is true. And it looks like a Daily Beast article with its own questions that is bringing up arguments about why you shouldn't think it's true. That's what adults in a society do. They evaluate these kinds of things. And while you can think that one or both of these articles is misinformation, you'll only know what that is. What is misinformation? What is real information? By triangulating and using critical thinking skills for yourself and not handing off that responsibility to either Josh Hawley or Mark Zuckerberg or Jack, which is what makes all of this so ironic for Facebook and Twitter, right? They restricted this. They're trying to add context to the conversation. They think it's lies. They think the New York Post story isn't a good one. And what comes out of that entire process Well, what comes out of that process is things like variety, adding a bullhorn to the story, saying Facebook and Twitter put restrictions on New York Post's Hunter Biden smoking gun story, big picture the article, updates, an entire reference to what the article says about Hunter Biden. Yes, the Barbara Streisand effect is real and Twitter keeps doing it. Twitter and Facebook now jointly have done it, where I don't know that I would have ever seen this New York Post article yesterday if it wasn't for Twitter and Facebook acting in this manner. So not only are they poor censors, not only are they ineffective censors, not only do they limit to the extent that they do these kinds of things, our own ability to critically examine what is misinformation and what is not for ourselves, they also have exactly the opposite effect that they are intending which leaves me with this final bit. Look, as I said in this video, Twitter is a private entity. I don't really think that the campaign finance laws should be used against them in this fashion, no matter what the very strident members of the Republican Judiciary Committee think or what Senator Hawley thinks. I don't really think that's appropriate. I think Twitter should be allowed to take these steps, but I certainly think that we should be allowed to criticize them for taking those steps. So as a private entity, Twitter can do what it wants, but there is no question that any hand-waving it makes towards valuing freedoms of speech and communication as of now, 
maybe as of before, and I'm sure you can bring up examples in the comments to this video, any hand-waving towards those freedoms should be rightly ignored. Twitter doesn't actually believe in those things. Twitter believes it is an arbiter of what is true and what is false. Twitter has left any knowledge of those freedoms far behind for this election and beyond. I understand folks not wanting misinformation, but I'd rather judge it for myself rather than have Mark Zuckerberg judge it for me. This has been Virtual Legality for today. If you enjoyed this video, we are talking about these kinds of things, the business and law of usually pop culture, video games, music, movies, and television, but also internet, technology, big tech, software, social media, and the like. So please do share, tell folks that we're here, ring bells, do other things that YouTube asks you to do to know when we put up a new video. We really very much appreciate that effort. We've been growing pretty good and we would like to continue that growth. If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.